what we're going to do with this is um sorry i'm trying to set up the record get the recording going and talk at the same time um <clears throat> what atomic mass really is is like okay if we took a hundred atoms and we averaged the mass what are we going to get because we don't really have like an even amount it's not like we have equal probability of getting all three of these isotopes right yeah and so what the a percent abundance is, is basically the probability if you pick one, one atom at random, that it would be that specific isotope. So if you picked one atom at random, there's a 92.2% chance it's gonna be silicon 28. <clears throat> and just a reminder how, those, how that notation works, right? If it's up and to the right, this is gonna be your charge. We're not talking about charge here though. We're talking up into the left is the mass. So silicon 28. Um, so this is the symbol for it. We would write it like this. Just means that the total number of protons plus neutrons is 28, right? We all know that by this point, I think. So we have a mass for it. Interestingly enough, our mass is less than 28. <laughs> Anybody know why that might be the case? The mass of a single a single hydrogen is more than one. Close, because the electrons are super, super light, right? But it's not off by that much. So electrons is a good guess. It turns out when you actually bind a bunch of protons and neutrons together to make a nucleus, some of the mass disappears. Um, it's what's called nuclear binding energy. Basically, the, you have to, uh, one of the forces that holds these nuclei together um, basically converts some of the mass to pure energy, and that's actually what holds a nucleus together. If, you, if you've ever heard of splitting the atom, as referred to uh, as an energy source, basically what you're doing is you're breaking apart the nucleus and you're releasing some of that nuclear binding energy. So you'll, you'll notice that even for something where you've got an integer number of, um, of protons plus neutrons, we're not going to have a nice neat number when it comes to the AMU. Um, and again, once we get into nuclear chemistry and we start talking about nuclear reactions, we'll be able to talk about why that is. We'll actually be able to calculate that energy. We'll actually use E equals MC squared to calculate how much energy is released in a nuclear reaction. Um, which is kind of fun. Henry? Hey, why doesn't that violate like, uh, the key word was the second to last word you said, energy and mass. Turns out it's not two laws. It's not conservation of energy and conservation of mass. It's the conservation of mass and energy. Basically, mass is just another form of energy. It's just a form that has gravity. Um, and so we wind up with with it being able, nuclear reactions in particular can convert mass into energy or vice versa. And they do so with this relationship. When you, the mass that disappears, when you compare all of the pieces compared to what its mass actually is measured as, you take that in kilograms times the speed of light squared, you get energy units. And that's the amount of nuclear binding energy for that particular isotope. So it's, um, this is definitely what Einstein's best known for, right? And in the, what the, the full title of this, it's not just E equals MC squared. He proved energy mass equivalence. He proved that mass really is just energy, which is kind of, hard to wrap your head around, um, but very fascinating to think about. All right, so back to this problem. If we have all these different probabilities and all these different masses, what's the average probability if we're gonna take a whole big set, like picking a hundred atoms out? We're just gonna take that percent abundance as a decimal and multiply it by the score in that area, just like we did with our with our first Excel lab, our first spreadsheets lab, where we looked at, we took like 30% of the grade was quizzes, right? So we said 0.3 times the score in that category. The percent abundance is like the weight in that, in that uh, class that we made up. 
So you're going to take 0.922 times 27.977. The mass is like the score in that category. And then all we do is add them up. Mathematically, it's there's a there's a more complicated way to, to show it. Your atomic mass is equal to the sum. Has anybody seen sigma notation before? Yes. Basically, it just means you're going to be doing a bunch of addition, right? You're going to take all of the pieces, and you're going to take the probability of that piece times the mass of that piece and add them all up together. Right, well, this is a this is a compact way of writing it, but it's not the easiest to see what's going on. So one of, this is the general form. A lot of times what's easy, easiest to do is to immediately turn around and write it out. We know we only have three isotopes. So instead of writing it like this in the indefinite form, we can actually just say the percent abundance as a decimal of, I guess we'll write it out as variables first. Percent abundance of 28 times mass of 28 plus percent abundance of 29 times mass of 29 plus percent abundance of 30, 30 or 31? 30 times the mass of 30. Where this letter, we talked about mole fraction yet or this variable? Does it look familiar yet? Okay. I didn't think so, I just was checking. I don't like to repeat too often. Um, so this is not actually an X, it's a Greek letter chi. Um, and chi stands for basically percent abundance as a fraction, as a decimal. So it's the probability, the weighted average of each of these. All right, so if we have all of these, we have all the percent abundances, we have two of the masses, and we have the, the standard atomic mass. So we have everything except for this right here. So once you know how to set it up like this, now it's just algebra, right? So, and there are other ways algebraically you could set this up and still get the right answer. Um, this is the way that lets me introduce you to mole fraction uh, as a variable and write it out in a generic form because there, this will be on the midterm. There will be a problem just like this on the midterm, except with different numbers. And maybe I have you so solve for a percent abundance and solve instead of solving for a mass. It's not going to be the same time as your regular midterms. Um, yeah, I, th I think I have it set up so that it's halfway through my time with you. So it's basically off by a couple weeks from, from the regular midterms. All right, so it'll be, it'll be before, before Thanksgiving, but a week or two after regular midterms. Okay. Um, and actually maybe what we'll do, we might even do it over over two days so that we can, so that there's less time pressure. Maybe we'll do a part one and a part two. I've never right. tried that before, but that might work with the, with the uh, schedule that we have here. All right, let me think about that. That just occurred to me. Um, so when we're trying to solve this then, is there really anything tricky once we know to start plugging in numbers? So it's gonna be 0.922 times 27.977 plus 0 0.047 times mass of 29. That's what we're trying to solve for. And then we've got 0 0.031 times 29.974. All of that equals the standard uh, atomic mass, <clears throat> excuse me, which is 28.086. So I just start doing the arithmetic, multiply stuff out, combine like terms, solve for x. Does that make that one make more sense? 
if I, if you saw one in the, the setup on the midterm is almost identical to this too. When we get closer to the midterm, I'll give you a practice midterm, which will just be last year's um, midterm with, so all that's going to be different about it, but we might, we might mess with it and do parts one through six on one day and four through 10 on the next, or in six through 10 on the, the second day, but it'll be the same format for all the questions. I'm not going to get tricky. I'm not trying to trip you up with the test. I'm trying to test you on basic skills that we're picking up in this class. Um, so you'll be able to see it, but literally it's this exact same format. I'll give you some information about an element. I'll give you some information about percent abundance and masses, and I'll ask you to, to solve for one of the pieces. And so if this one doesn't make sense to you, ask me at the end of class today and we'll see if we can uh, help with that one. Writing electron configuration, so should be pretty straightforward. I think we spent some time on that. Enough time, hopefully. What's the only real tricky part about it? The D block is offset, right? And the F, soft, F block is offset by two. Other than that, if you've got a periodic table, you're good to go. So this is writing it out, um, which I, I usually call those a, a atomic orbital energy diagram, an energy diagram, or something like that. When I say elect electron configuration, I mean write it out one s two two s two. So just like what you have there, just showing showing the lines and arrows. Abbreviated to you can do just the last um, past the last double gas. All right. Any any other questions on yesterday's assignment? Okay. Ions, atomic radius. This is good. This is actually what we we're going to get into in just a second. So perfect timing. So what's different about an ion compared to it, the, the neutral version of that element? Charge because of? What's different about a chlorine atom versus a chlorine ion? Number of electrons. That's what I was looking for. We have one extra electron here, right? So doing our electron dot our electron configuration, we would just add one more electron in, right? Adding one extra electron, is that really good? What's that gonna change when it comes to the radius though? I mean, it depends a little bit. All of our same variables still apply. Basically, how many energy levels do we have? that are occupied and uh, how many protons do we have in the nucleus? So if we're looking at 5A, nitrogen, phosphorus, or fluorine, they're all pretty close up there. Nitrogen versus phosphorus, we can compare those. Which one's bigger? Nitrogen versus phosphorus. Phosphorus is bigger because it's got an extra energy level occupied, right? And what about nitrogen versus fluorine? Nitrogen's bigger and why? Fewer protons. You got fewer protons, they're not sucking those electrons in as strongly, right? We're gonna use the same exact logic with ions. We just look at how many electrons it has, how many energy levels it has, and compare that to how many protons it has. So for instance, if we had Chlorine with a negative charge versus fluorine with a negative charge. Does it matter that they have a charge when we're figuring out which of those two is bigger? No. The electrons don't actually make much difference in terms of size if we're in the same energy level, right? Because we're still putting them into the same space. Um, I guess if you had, does, 
Does adding more kids to your family change the size of your house? No, until you get to the point where you have to get a new house, right? Getting a larger house is like going up an energy level. Adding more kids doesn't really affect the size of the house itself until you get to a new energy level. All right, so fluorine versus chlorine, when they're charged, we can still look at them and say, well, chlorine's got more, more electrons in more energy levels, right? So we can still say chlorine with a negative charge is bigger than chlorine with a negative charge. So what about magnesium? What is What can we compare magnesium to? How many electrons does that magnesium ion have? The same as neon, right? Which also matches one of the other ones up there, doesn't it? So the fluorine with a negative charge and magnesium with a plus two charge both have 10 electrons, right? So which means they have the same number of energy levels. So if they have the same number of energy levels, what's the only thing that's different between them? The number of protons. Which one has more protons? Magnesium. So does that make magnesium bigger or smaller? Smaller. More protons means it's going to suck those electrons in tighter. So it's the same logic, the same two variables that we're looking at. When we're looking at ions, we're still looking at how many energy levels are occupied and how many protons are there. We just have to do a little bit more thinking because we can't just look at the periodic table. We also have to look at how many electrons did it gain or lose? And does that change things like the number of energy levels you have? So out of these three, which one's the biggest? The chlorine ion. It's the only one that's got electrons in N equals three, right? Fluorine and magnesium both have the same number of electrons. Which one is smaller out of these? The magnesium is smaller. So fluoride, the fluoride is going to be in the middle. Magnesium is the smallest. Chlorine is the biggest. Does that make sense, Brody? Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about ionization energy a little bit. Let's look at neon versus silicon versus fluorine. Which of those would we expect to have the largest ionization energy? Yeah. And why? Because it's uh, the highest stuff and most right. It's highest and most right, and it's a noble gas already. It's already got a full p orbital, right? The, the electron configuration for neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. If we were going to take an electron away, we would have to break up a full p orbital, which we've already talked about how that's really not very favorable. That's really hard to do. It's hard to take an electron away from fluorine too, but at least we don't have to break up a full orbital to do it. And then how about, so then by process of elimination, silicon's got to be, be the easiest for several reasons. It's got more uh, energy levels. So our highest occupied energy level, our valence energy level is N equals three instead of N equals two. So that means it's not being held in as tightly. And then it also is further to the left as well, right? So it's further away from having a full energy level. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. That's a lot easier to take that electron away than it is to take either of these electrons away because we're in n equals three and we're not even that close to a full orbital. What about sodium, magnesium, and aluminum? Those ones are actually all in a row. It seems like they should be easy. Of course, when I put it like that, it makes you second guess it, right? What are their electron configurations look like? Sodium, magnesium, aluminum. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. 
everything the same except it's going to be 3s2. And it's, this one's going to be 3p1. Good. So if we're taking one electron away from each of these, which one's going to be the easiest to take an electron away from? Sodium. sodium. Why? What happens when we take one electron away from sodium? It's going to get really stable. Taking one electron away is enough to make sodium look like neon, right? Make it look like a noble gas, which makes it really stable. Landon? That's a good, why would you suspect aluminum? It's got one electron in a p orbital. When we take one electron away from an aluminum, now we're down to only full, full orbitals, right? Yeah. But we didn't get all the way to having an entirely full energy level. So this is going to be the easiest, but then aluminum seems like it should be the second easiest. And you're right. We would expect, based on the trend, just looking at the periodic table, our rule was further up into the right ionization energy got higher, right? Yeah. Except that there's little zigzags in this. If you actually plot this, if you look at ionization energy versus atomic number for that first or any the n equals two row, it's going to go something like, so lithium is right here. So this is energy or ionization energy. So lithium is pretty easy to take an electron away from. Beryllium is a little bit harder. Then it actually jogs back down to boron. And then carbon. And then nitrogen. And then it jogs back down again for oxygen. And then it goes up again. So these little zigzags. The overall trend is when you go from left to right on the periodic table, your ionization energy gets higher, but there's these little jagged parts, little saw teeth. Those saw teeth are when something else is happening based on the electron configuration. Basically, it's hard to break up full orbitals. It's hard to break up orbitals that are exactly halfway full. Nitrogen has a, has a p orbital that's exactly halfway full. That's not as stable as being completely full, but it's better than being two thirds full or one third full. So having an orbital that's exactly halfway full is also really fairly stable. And so that means you see these discontinuities, these saw teeth, when we're looking at ionization energy. So that's what 5D was asking about is if we're looking at sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, sodium is the easiest because we make something that's super stable. But then aluminum is the next easiest because now we don't have a partially filled P orbital. And then magnesium, out of these three, magnesium actually has the highest ionization energy because to break up, to take an electron away, means we have to break up a full S orbital. Right, so there's a reason why we started with electron configuration and talking about the orbitals because all of these other all of these other um, periodic trends come back to electron configuration and energy levels. We can explain all of these other trends in terms of molecular orbital diagrams or atomic orbital diagrams and electron configuration. In fact, I think on the on the slides for today, where'd the mouse go? Or what's going on here? There we go. That's why I couldn't find it. Hang on, I gotta find my, <laughs> where my slides go here. There we go.
All right. So were there any more questions on the assignment from yesterday? That'll do it. Okay. Let's talk about one more periodic. Well, it's really two more periodic properties, both two with two names. So ionization energy is sort of is is the energy required to take an electron away. There's a periodic property called electron affinity that's the exact opposite. So electron affinity is keep that out of there. Um, electron affinity, instead of being the energy that it requires to remove an electron, electron affinity is how much energy does something release when you give it an electron, which you can kind of figure out from the name. What does affinity mean? Not infinity, affinity. An attraction. Did I spell that right? Affinity. Yeah. If you have an affinity for something, it usually means you like it or you're attracted to it, or you're good at it. <laughs> I'm not actually sure how you would turn that into a verb, but the proper term, I'm sure there is one. Affinitize. Um, so electron affinity is how much something wants to gain an electron. So ionization energy is how tightly does it hold on to the electrons it has. Electron affinity is how how easily does it gain an electron? How much does it want to gain an electron? So you can see how those would be related, right? If something has a high ionization energy, it also usually has a high electron affinity. Like fluorine only needs to gain one electron to have a full energy level, right? So fluorine has a very high electron affinity. It also has a high ionization energy. But what about what about neon? Neon has an even even higher ion, ionization energy. Does neon have a high electron affinity? Why not? It's already full, right? If we gave it an extra electron, now we'd have to start putting electrons into the next energy energy level. So it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit different than ionization energy. It's talking about related properties, but they're not quite the same. And a lot of times we'll actually talk about electron affinity when we start talking about covalent bonds. We'll start talking about electron affinity. The other term for it is called electronegativity. Have you heard that term before to talk about that at all in, uh, in your first chem class? A little bit? A little bit. Yeah. So electron affinity and electronegativity are related, except we usually we use electro, electronegativity to talk about how evenly electrons are shared in bonds. And electron affinity is straight up, I'm going to give this atom an extra electron. Does it become more stable or less stable? So again, they, electron affinity and electronegativity are really close to the same, but they're not technically the same by definition. They're just correlated strongly. Uh, and then one more, one more um, periodic trend. This one I don't, I'm not going to ever ask you about on a test because this one's kind of hard to define. Um, metallic character is actually a periodic trend as well. So metallic character means how metal something is. Right, so, and that's, it's not actually what you would expect necessarily when it comes to the periodic trend. Because where are the metals that we're used to see, thinking about as metals? If I took a sixth grader and I told them to, to uh, point to something metal or what type of metal would be on the periodic table, what would they guess? Iron. Iron. Iron's a square in the middle of the D block, so that doesn't seem much like it's that close to 
to any of our regular periodic trains, but the most of our periodic trains go right, oh, all the way to the right and all the way to the top, right? Iron square in the middle. Gold, silver, and copper. Like coins are probably like the first thing that a kid has experience with that I guess maybe not anymore. People don't use cash anymore. But um, you know, finding copper pennies is you know a core memory for as a five-year-old kid, right? Find a copper penny and pick it up and you have good luck all day. It's that still a thing, right? So but copper is actually not that metallic of a metal in terms of metallic character. Metallic character means things have really high conductivity. They're very malleable. What does malleable mean? Bendable. It actually literally comes from the root um, malus in Latin means hammer. Something malleable means that you can hammer it flat or you can make foil out of it by literally just hitting it with a hammer. Um, so metals are, are malleable. Metals tend to have really high electrical conductivity and usually high thermal conductivity as well. Um, they also tend to be what's called ductile, which is kind of like malleable. What does, does anybody know what ductile means? Close, ductile strength is means what? It's kind of related to tensile strength. Basically, when you pull on something, you stretch it, that means it's ductile. So you can actually take a chunk of copper metal, and you can grab both ends of it with really strong vices and pull it and make copper wire out of it. That's ductile. But the most ductile, malleable, shiniest, um, most metal elements are actually the ones that have the lowest ionization energy. Where would we expect to see them? Where's the lowest ionization energy? Bottom left. So, but the thing is, they're so reactive in the presence of oxygen that we never actually see those elements as metals. Sodium is actually more metallic than aluminum, but we don't see sodium metal very often. Why? Because it forms salt. Did you, did uh, any of your other chemistry classes do the experiment where you, or not experiment, the demonstration where you throw sodium metal in water? No. We can do that at one point. Does anybody know what happens? It explodes. It explodes. It, first it melts really quickly. The, um, the sodium metal melts and it starts fizzing and giving off bubbles. Those bubbles are hydrogen gas. And it, then it actually, um, starts putting off enough heat that it ignites the hydrogen gas that's, that it's emitting. And so it catches on fire. And then if it's a big enough chunk, it'll actually explode. Um, so obviously we don't really want to use sodium for a lot of the applications where we want metals, right? We don't want to make circuits out of sodium metal, even if it's a really good conductor, because we don't want them catching on fire every time they're exposed to water. And potassium is even better partly because it's more likely to, like, it, it reacts more violently is what I should say, um, which if that's what you're looking for, makes it even more fun. Um, Cause not only does it explode like almost every time it does so with purple sparks because you did the so saw sodium in your flame test the other day, right? Those whitish purple flames. Um, picture making a firework that color. And that's what happens when you throw potassium metal in water. That is how those flame tests are exactly how fireworks work. You take those metal ions, um, that we, the same ones that we used in our flame test, you take them and you put package them with something that um, explodes very quickly instead of something that burns slowly, then you get a firework. Um, the earliest version, now they have fancier was they basically get more creative with, uh, with the explosives to make them burn either slower or sparkle when they're going. Um, and, and they do different mixtures to get different colors, but that's exactly how a firework works. You just take, take some metal ions, you heat them up really, really hot and make them explode. Usually with the earliest forms, we're just using black powder, um, back in the, in the Mulan days, um, of ancient China. They were, they were the first recorded fireworks were going back in ancient China. Um, probably. <coughs> I want to say about 600 CE, but that's a guess. 
So feel free to correct me on that as, as all my guesses, if you have better information. All right, so. And again, because metallic character is really like a combination of a whole bunch of different things, um, I'm not really gonna ask you about which of these is more metal than the other, um, because it, that's not a very, that's not a very well-worded question. I, so I, I want you to be aware of it. Um, that idea of metallic character and some of the factors that go into it. Um, but I'm not going to ask you about that on the test. Uh, another interesting historical note. Uh, I mentioned that malice is the uh, M-A-L-L-U-S -L -L is the Latin for hammer. Um, that shows up, that word shows up a lot actually in pop culture, um, maybe not pop culture, pop culture. In history, there's actually a French emperor named Charles Martel that comes from the same root. The French word for hammer from Latin in the old French is Martel. So that was Charles the hammer. Um, or if you've ever heard of Malus Maleficarum, is the Hammer of Witches. It was actually a book used, a, like the handbook that was used by the Spanish Inquisition when they were torturing people to try and determine who was a witch. They had actually a textbook called the Malus Maleficarum. Uh, Maleficarum is the, is the Latin word for witch or, or a um, magic user. Fun thing since it's spooky season and all. All right, what else? was on here. We talked about all these charges. We're not going to get into naming today. We'll do that on Friday. All right. Then I, that's all of the stuff that I wanted to cover for today. So I, so we can go ahead and start working on those on that gizmos assignment for tomorrow. Um, get a head start on it. Um, do we need, should we get printed copies of that assignment too properly? Probably. Yesterday? Um, no, sorry, the one that I'm giving them right now. Um, so I can print it from here. Okay. Okay. Then every, everybody can can start working on the um, on the gizmos. Get everything pulled up, and I'll make I'll make some copies and some get some stuff printed. Thank <laughs> you.